Welcome to this video presentation on the measurement of substructures. On the completion of this video tutorial, you will be able to understand the provisions of NRM2 in the context of groundworks. In addition, you will be confident to measure and describe simple substructures. Substructures come in many shapes and sizes from simple housing schemes to complex, multi-rise buildings. It is important that when we measure substructures, that we have a common definition. One place to find such a definition is the BCIS standard form of cost analysis. This is the definition of substructures taken from the standard form of cost analysis. For a more complete definition, refer to the BCIS Elemental Standard Form of Cost Analysis. Groundwork is synonymous with risk. I remember when I was a student, the ground being described as infinitely variable. This is because no two sites are the same and many factors can impact on operations, such as unstable ground, the height of the water table, rock, or other hard materials. NRM2 now contains a definition of rock, as this has long been a bone of contention between contractors and clients' QSs. The definition is, rock is any boulder greater than five cubic meters, and additionally, any boulder that can be removed by an excavator bucket is not rock. For logistical reasons, Underground drainage is generally carried out simultaneously with the substructure work. This example is taken from Appendix G of New Rules of Measurement 2 and details typical contents of a groundworks package. Note the inclusion of below ground drainage. As can be seen, the taking off list for substructures is extensive and covers several NRM2 work sections, from lifting turf right through to the masonry in the external walls. Note that currently earthwork support only needs to be measured and included in the bill of quantities when the contractor is specifically instructed to do so. This instruction will come from the engineer or the contract administrator and the taker off mustn't take it on their shoulders to make this decision. When building on virgin sites, a considerable amount of preliminary site work may be required. There is only one way to assess the extent of the work, and that is to visit the site and to make notes and or take videos. Urban sites in particular can be dumping grounds for all sorts of items, large and small. I once remember a site where we discovered a large safe. It was empty, I should add, but it was very heavy and needed considerable effort and cost to remove. All such items have to be logged and included in the bill of quantities or work package. In this video, we will be looking at strip foundations, of which there are basically two types as shown here. On the left, the more traditional strip foundation, and on the right, deep strip or trench fill. Trench fill is more widely used. The name is derived from the fact that the trench is filled with concrete, thereby eliminating the need for masonry work in the trench. Whichever approach is adopted, note that on the external skin, the face work is carried two courses below ground level. This is purely from an appearance point of view, and we will return to this during the measurement example that follows. So here are the details of a simple foundation using a traditional strip foundation. Note the weak mixed concrete cavity filling. This is used to prevent any water that ends up in the cavity does not run to the base of the foundations and cause problems. The top surface of the cavity filling 
slopes to the external skin. The idea being that any water will run off and escape through so-called weep holes. These are where the vertical joints of the brickwork or perpens are left open, that's to say, without mortar. Following any clearance of the site, the first task is to reduce levels as shown in blue on this page. Reducing levels is taken for the entire footprint of the building to the external faces of the foundations. All excavation, of course, produces varying amounts of excavated material. Some of this can be reused in making up levels into landscape areas, but much of it has to be removed from site as it is unsuitable. Any contaminated excavated material must be kept separate and disposed of carefully in an appropriate tip. This is a good time to refer to page 134 of New Rules of Measurement 2. Earthworks is one of the number of NRM2 work sections that gives the taker off alternative ways to describe items. As can be seen in level 1, the classification for this item is bulk excavation, which includes, according to the notes and comments, reduced levels, basements, pools, etc. The taker off may choose to classify this item as bulk excavation or, if preferred, reduced level excavation. In fact, most QSs use both terms as shown on the next page. So here we go with the worked example. In this case, we are using traditional setting out. In other presentations, spreadsheet applications will be used. It may be a good idea to print off the drawing on page 11. To the external dimensions of the walls, we add twice times 250 millimeters to give the overall area of the excavation, 15.5 by 7.5. The reduced level excavation is 150 millimeters deep. Note, as previously mentioned, the excavator material has been removed from site. The next item on the taking off list is the foundation excavation. And for this, we will need to calculate the mean girth or center line of the trench. However, once calculated, we will be able to use it for a number of items. To calculate the mean girth from the external dimensions, add the length and width together, multiply by two, and then deduct four times, twice times, half times the thickness of the wall, in this case, 275 millimeters, to give us 42.9. A more detailed explanation is included on the next two slides. This slide shows the logic behind the use of mean girths or center lines. Calculate the length using the external face and you overmeasure. Again, if you calculate the length using the inside face, you undermeasure. Therefore, use the average of the two or center line girth, shown here in yellow. Center lines are calculated on the basis of the number of external angles. This slide shows one external angle from the previous slide. When using the external dimension, for each external angle, it is necessary to deduct half the thickness of the wall from both the length and the width, and then multiply this by the number of external angles, which in this case is four. When the foundations are complete, the trench will have to be backfilled with excavator material, as shown here. The best way to calculate the net amount of backfill required is to allow for the trench to be completely filled with material, see page 15, and then later, when the concrete and the masonry is measured, deduct the volumes displaced to leave the net volume. 
Now, turn to page 152 of NOM2. In situ concrete is another work section where the taker of has alternative approaches to describing items. The foundation may be described as horizontal work or foundations. See notes and comments. Again, most people have elected to use both terms as shown on this video on page 20. Once more, the mean girth is used for this item. Note that concrete work poured directly onto earth or unblinded hardcore has to be described. The reason being that concrete is deemed to be poured into formwork and pouring on earth will require more than the net volume of concrete as this method of placing is so imprecise. The estimator should allow a percentage addition to the bill of quantities to allow for this. As referred to previously, now the concrete has been measured, adjustments can be made for the backfilling and the removal of spoil. Now to the masonry. I would also recommend reference to the masonry video tutorial. Once again, we can use the mean girth for this item. Because the wall comprises two skins or leaves of brickwork, either side of the center line, we can use the mean girth and multiply by two. The height is calculated from dimensions on the drawing. This page contains yet another two items that can utilize the mean girth. Forming a cavity and building in wall ties is a measurable item, as is the concrete cavity filling discussed earlier. Even though the concrete filling is only 50 millimeters wide, it is measured in cubic meters. Page 167 of New Rules of Measurement 2 contains the rules for the measurement of cavities, discussed earlier, and damper of courses, which will be dealt with on the next page. Once again, the mean girth can be used for this item, and you've probably come to the conclusion that it's essential that the calculation of the mean girth is accurate. Any error will have a knock-on effect for several items. A damper of course, or DPC, is required for both skins or leaves of the external wall. Bitumen damper, of course, is supplied in rolls 30 meters long. At the junction of the rolls, the damper, of course, is lapped 150 millimeters. But when taking off quantities, this is not taken into account and the DPC is measured net. Once again, the estimator should make an allowance for this when pricing the bill. We must now make some adjustments to the backfill and removal of spoil. The first item on this page is an adjustment for the masonry in the trench to the filling measured on page 15. In addition, a strip of reduced level excavation measured on page 14 must be reinstated. To do this, the center line of the strip has to be calculated as shown here. Starting with the girth of the external face, 44 meters, add four times, twice times, half times, 250, to arrive at the mean girth. This page contains items associated with the ground floor slab, and they all have the same footprint, 14.45 by 6.45. The difference is, that NOM2 requires some of the items to be measured in square meters and some in cubic meters. A quick tip to cope with this, as shown here, is to have one set of dimensions, add items on, and then adjust the cubic meters as shown. There are alternative approaches, and if using a spreadsheet, then adding on is not possible. Damp-proof membranes are measured in section five, excavating and filling, 
on page 138. Also here is another example of the incorrect use of dotted lines. You will recall that we measured two skins of common brickwork on page 21. We must now adjust this to take account of the two courses of facework needed on the external face, as explained earlier. Before we leave Groundworks, let's have a look at a couple of items. The first is support to the faces of excavation. This item is not generally measured, and the contractor or subcontractor must make their own allowances in their pricing to cover the cost. The only time earthwork support is measured is when the contractor is instructed specifically to include it. If you think back to the opening of this video, I described the ground as infinitely variable, and it is common to encounter a variety of materials or obstructions, some of which are listed on page 135 of NRM2. Different types of excavation are measured as extra over, the excavation previously measured. This item takes the form of additional quantities to the main excavation and allows a contractor or subcontractor to include for any extra costs. Now, before moving on to the next video, have a go at doing these self-assessment questions. Here are some of the other video tutorials available in this program. Here are a few links which you may find useful.